everyone, and welcome to the Undisputed Heavyweight Champion of the World Show, made for the fans by a fan. I am your host, as always, Richard Tiemann, and this is the award-winning fan show, and this is another College Gridiron Showcase mini-series episode as we continue the countdown to hashtag CGS2020. Joining me now is Don. Uh, Don, welcome. How are you doing, man? Richard, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm kind of confused. I thought we were going to do the wrestling show today, man. <laughs> you know, you and I have been meaning to do a lot of different uh, stuff over the last year. Because last year, yeah, we were going to do um, a, a couple of different episodes like that. But um, it's good to talk to you again. I know that you're a busy man. Now, how do you pronounce your last name? Is it Povia or Povia? I know that sometimes... No, you had, you had the first time you had it right, Povia. Povia? Okay, I thought it was something a little bit more with like a, you know, a bit of an accent on it. But all right, so Don Povia, and uh, you were at CGS last year. You and I met, and we had a lot of great conversations, some about wrestling, which is, I was like, you know, I should have you back for the wrestling episode. <laughs> so it's that, belt, it's that belt you carry around, just uh, struck my fancy, I'll tell you. Yeah, we gotta uh, definitely get you one. I, I don't know for why, but we'll we'll figure it out. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way. Sounds good. Yeah, well, I was I was there last year. I think I've been there all but the first one. Uh, I've been serving on the board of advisors. Uh, we originally got brought in uh, myself and, and the company that I started uh, called Transition Sports Entertainment. Uh, started that with uh, Keith Bullock, a uh, former three-time All-Pro. Uh, he's been down to CGS a couple times. Um, but, yeah, we were originally brought in to just sort of consult on the, the branding side of it. Uh, we had done uh, the logo that you see. We, we run the website uh, and put together that website. Uh, really, the initial step was it was in its infancy and, and how could we come in and try to sort of clean it up, professionalize it a little bit, at least from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, and, you know, Craig and Jose and the team were, were really happy with that work. And, and shortly thereafter asked me to be on that advisory board. And I've been back every year since, and I'll be going down there this year. I uh, usually talk to guys. It started out about sort of responsibility and social media, more on the marketing side. But I think it's really evolved as our company has uh, to be more about, you know, how they carry themselves and, and sort of the pitfalls of the business, you know, through a lens of marketing and, and how they're able to really, uh, extract as much value from their careers and, and from their personas as possible. Uh, and, you know, the name of our company being Transition is, is how you're able to transition, whether it's from the college level to the pro level or, you know, once guys like Keith, who came up with the notion, um, was the idea of, hey, I'm a 10-year vet. I led the league in tackles one year, led my team in tackles seven years in a row. And I get hurt and, uh, you know, kind of get discarded. <laughs> and hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully I'm not left out there on my own. And, and he certainly wasn't, but saw teammates that were. So how then we help guys, you know, try to transition uh, to the next stage of their lives, which, hey, if you're lucky to play 10 years and you're 32 years old and make a couple million dollars, that's great. But, you know, God willing, you have 60 more years to live. And what are you doing with those other 60 years? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think um... – you know, for Jose and Craig, they're they're tough to win over. So I think if you're one of the people that obviously made an impression and a good enough one that they wanted you to come back, I think that that is fantastic. So, you know, give us a little bit of your hero origin story here, how you got into sports and then specifically transition sports. Sure. Uh, I, I started out, I was actually a college football player. I played a, a little over a year at Monmouth, uh, was riddled by some injuries we've had a couple of mammoth players uh, <laughs> at cgs in the last couple of years i'm proud to say but back when i was playing it was, it was non-scholarship it was one double a back before fcs um but you know i was always in the sports i played football since i was about five years old uh i was all state with star ledger in jersey um for group three first team uh you know my senior year so a pretty successful career on the field but once i got to college i realized um, probably wasn't going pro and, and that non-scholarship, you know, felt like I was a pro in college and not getting compensated for it. Uh, started focusing on other things. Um, ended up, uh, I studied history, studied politics. I uh, got my master's in that, uh, was in politics for probably about eight to 10 years. Um, really learned to hate it. <laughs> and, uh, but <laughs> as I was doing that, I was also blogging and podcasting in the sports space, albeit anonymously, uh, but actually built a really strong connection with, um, you know, then bloggers all across the country. But those bloggers include, you know, Will Brinson, 
you know, who's now with CBS and guys that were Deadspin and Yahoo and, and people that were, you know, smaller and then kind of grew into these national positions. And I, I realized uh, I threw an event, you know, 300 of these guys showed up, ESPN showed up, Sports Illustrated showed up and realized I was kind of onto something in bridging old media and new media. I was able to sort of speak to both worlds. I had, you know, face-to-face connections in both worlds and especially online. Nobody had really done that 10 years ago. We're talking about 10 years ago now. Um, and you really parlayed that into people approaching me about being, you know, almost a consultant for uh, sports strategist and digital strategist. Um, did my own thing for a while, worked with everyone from Tiki Barber when he was launching Thuzio, John Runyon when he was running for Congress, Kobayashi, the hot dog eater, when he was leaving ESPN. So all guys, as you can see, that kind of <laughs> theme of transitioning from one thing to another. And, and that really planted the seeds for that early on. But in between, I ended up working for a couple of PR agencies, work with some big brands, um, you know, like consumer brand types in the sports space. Um, worked with a, a digital agency uh, who wanted me to expand their capabilities on the other side. So the PR people wanted me to get them more digital. The digital people wanted me to get them more traditional. And as you can see, I've kind of always uh, stayed in that middle part um, and, and kind of embraced that. So, um, you know, I ended up um, winning some Yankees business for uh, for an agency, uh, ended up growing that business. Uh, the agency became their digital agency of record to their creative agency of record. So I'm doing, you know, commercials and print work and strategy for, you know, one of the biggest franchises in the world. Put my kids in a commercial. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, no shame. Uh, no shame. This, yeah, no. Did some uh, did some work with NASCAR, you know, pretty recently. Um, but you know, my my passion always kind of came back to uh, those conversations with Keith. And so, about five six years ago, Keith was going back to get his MBA um, from George Washington through one of the programs that uh, the NFL was offering, and uh, said, "Hey, I want to write." business plan for this business and came up with the concept of transition. And a lot of that was not only helping guys transition, but taking some of these practices that I learned working with brands and trying to apply them to athletes. So when you hear athletes talking about being more than a, you know, more than an athlete and I'm a brand and I'm a business, they are, but they're also 22 year old kids that have played a sport their entire life. And I've never run a business, nonetheless, put on a camp by themselves. So <laughs> how do I surround them with, like, educate them, empower them? If they kind of rely on their parents, how do we also educate and empower their, their parents so that we can kind of make it a little more seamless for them and, and build a team around them? All these brands that I work with, it wasn't one CEO running their business. It was a group of experts that they surrounded themselves by that enabled them to grow. And so – trying to really educate guys in the mindset is, is that you are and you can be, but you need to take certain steps to get there. Um, you know, in, in the meantime, too, with that digital agency, uh, they got purchased by Vice. Uh, so on the media side, putting that digital media chops on, I was one of three guys that was really uh, hands-on in launching uh, Vice's sports vertical. Um, so, you know, I've had a PR background, I've had a digital background, I've had a media background. I've had a background where I've actually created the content myself and, you know, coming full circle, Keith and I are uh, about, well, we recorded about eight and put out about six, eight or nine, <laughs> put out six, uh, you know, we're podcasting again. Uh, I've also kind of tied that into that, that event, that conference that I did, um, you know, so really trying to, again, bring communities together show big picture and, and in many ways disrupt what I feel is, is a broken system, especially when it comes to sports, because things are very siloed and I feel the players are at a disadvantage because, you know, we'll see that the system goes on every year at CGS. We see the same agents there, you know, and, and they're recruiting players and they're putting these great ideas into their mind, which they should be. But if that player doesn't pan out, that's okay. Cause there's another crop of graduates coming through next time. Right. So the business goes on. The sport goes on, the agents and the agencies go on, the hangers on and the, and the marketers go on, but the players are replaceable, right? Commodities. And, and that's where we're trying to show them is that regardless of what you do, the fact that you're here, the fact that you're at an all-star game, the fact that you succeeded on a college level when a lot of guys, including myself, haven't, you know, despite our local glory and, hero, and heroism back home, um, you have value. 
and, and how do we not just throw you out like the rest of the system has? So, uh, hey, that's well, I don't know if I answered the question, but that's that's <laughs> kind of my it's kind of my story. That's kind of my philosophy there. Well, I guess on that note, then is there uh, is there one aspect of it that you prefer the digital, the marketing, the the sports? Part? Like, I mean, you you've done a lot. So, is there one that you kind of is is more your your passion than any of them? I actually feel that where my passion is 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 bringing all these things together. Right? Oh, yeah. When when I was working with say the PR agency, they're they're trying to tell me, all right, you go pitch bloggers and you come up with a Facebook idea. And what I was trying to say back then, and this is, you know, eight years ago is, is no, why aren't your traditional PR guys pitching digital? And why aren't we thinking digital mobile first instead of as an add on? So I think where I've had my foot in all these different doors and, and had different passions for each, I think really where I've been trying to convince people for years. And I think it's finally catching up is that all these things are really integrated. And that's much like it's much like the, the disconnect that is in, say, the sports industry. Right. There is an agent. There is a PR guy. There's a marketing guy. There's a financial guy. There's you know this guy. There's that guy. As a marketing guy, how often was I speaking with the agent? Pretty often, because generally speaking, for better or worse, they were the gatekeeper. But if I'm making decisions on a marketing and branding this guy and trying to earn him money and build his value, why am I not communicating with? the financial guy who might say, well, look, here's his financial situation. Maybe he can afford to take equity as opposed to a cash thing, or maybe this cash will be better broken up this way. Right. So things that you would do in the real world that weren't happening in the quote unquote sports world, even in term marketing, like the marketing guy, if I'm a marketing guy for a brand, right, I'm boosting that brand's value and trying to promote that brand's value. If I'm a marketing guy for an athlete, I'm trying to get him deals so I can collect 20%. Well, that's, that's sponsorship. That's not marketing. So even that, like, you know, those misnomers. So I think that really where my passion is, is that I have enough of an understanding and an expertise in some of these areas that I need to show people that they're not siloed, that they are all complementary to one another. And I think that's really what gets me up and going in the morning is how can I make all these things interface in, in a more efficient and effective way. Yeah, that's fair. And I, I think <laughs> that said, I love podcasting now. Like I've done <laughs> 50, 60 episodes 10 years ago before it was a, really a thing. Uh, and, but now getting back into it with Keith, <laughs> if I'm telling you what was most enjoyable, I'm really starting to enjoy that. Now that I'm doing that again. <laughs> I, I do love podcasting. I, I feel like it's become one of those things where like everybody does a podcast now. Cause I started mine five years yeah. ago and it was something where people knew what podcasts were, but not everybody had the ability to podcast. Like I had to really do my homework on how to make this thing work. And of course, you know, your equipment can only make you sound so good. The rest of course is your content and the way that you get through, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 50 minutes, however long in, of an episode that you do. But it's so hard to get traffic, to get noticed because it, it's like out beyond the logo and the way that you are active on social media. It's like every podcast looks the same. So yeah. um, props to you for getting back into it. I'm, I'm glad that you do. Um, I wasted a lot though, man. I had everybody <clears throat> from Gary Vaynerchuk to Jamel Hill to Jim Kelly on the show 10 years ago when nobody was listening to podcasts. <laughs> so uh, I wish I could go back and, and redo them or resurface them. I, Hell, I don't even know where the audio would exist now, too. But um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a struggle. And actually, um, I talked to a former Deadspin uh, editor, and I won't say his name, but he, he's been through some shit. And I've had some great conversations with him lately, and, and just even like kind of picking his brain about certain things on the content side. Um, I'm sorry, am I I'm for cursing? <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and he asked that very question, like, who needs another conference? Or who needs another, you know, another podcast? Everybody has these. And, and it really stuck with me. And that's why I've really tried to figure out, like, what our differentiator is and what our value is to people. So, you know, showing the quality, like you said, of, of the content, uh, you know, having, uh, you know, as best quality of, of the equipment and the sound and the output as possible. Yep. Um, but, but really showing, well, why, why should I listen to Don and Keith as opposed to listening to Jalen and Jacoby? Um, or in addition to listening to some of these guys. So, you know, really trying to hone in on uh, what makes us different, what makes us special, and what value add can we have to people. 
Yeah, and that's obviously where uh, Jose and Craig see the value in, in you and your mind, obviously, as far as being a consultant for CGS. So how did how did that whole conversation come about, and what will be different with your role with CGS this year as opposed to last year? Yeah, um, the, the conversation really sprung. I remember uh, we were introduced by somebody. Um, Craig gave it a go. Um, you know, they hired me to do a specific job. And I, I remember, and I'll say it, I remember Jose was kind of like, man, ah, well, why do we need this? And Craig was like, just, <laughs> just go look at what they did. Right. <laughs> and I think, so I think that was, and then Jose was like, yeah, cool. All right, great. These guys know what they're doing. Um, and, and I, I really think it kind of sprung from that, but you know, more than anything, especially early on, you know, as I have more business partners and different business partners looking for the value of CGS for me or in my time or the company itself, I think, you know, what's telling is they were one over as well and they, they enjoy going back, uh, you know, different groups that I've worked with always appreciate it. Um, you know, but at first it, it was, it, it was just that, what is the value? But I think it started with my passion for it, right? These guys, I don't, I, I listened to a couple of your other shows. I know it was described as, you know, last chance and underdogs and they are right. They're not going to the collegiate bowl. They're not maybe even going to the East West shrine bowl, but the more people I talk to is that, um, that gap is really shrinking. And, and yes. I, you know, I spoke with, you know, I spoke with scouts at, um, you know, at the combine a year or two ago. And, and they said like, even between talent wise with the, um, the NFL PA collegiate bowl and CGS, there, there was very little difference. Um, and that was straight from the horse's mouth. That wasn't me prompting or leading anybody in a particular direction. It was just something that was offered up to me. I think that's a testament to, you know, guys like Mike Riddleman and, and the guys that are, you know, doing the homework on the scouting side. So there is that notion of, look, they are a bit of an underdog. And I think that and and everything that I've built and done personally has been on my own volition and just going out there and scraping and flying. And the guys that I've seen and I've worked with, like at CGS, guys like Kenneth Farrow, I think in 2016, 2017, a guy that went from the Chargers that's got hurt, that battled injuries all the way through college that was kicking ass in the AAF that ends up getting drafted in the XFL. But guys like that, that are just like dogs, right. That just are going to work and, and push through and also really good people and really good character people. Um, I've always had great relationships with the players um, and, and I want them to succeed. And I want them to also, you know, everything that I talk about, just because you go from, the NFL to the XFL doesn't mean you don't have value. So with Kenneth, um, he actually asked me to be on his board of advisors for his nonprofit. So working with a guy to give back to youth in the community, and there was just a big profile on him with the uh, Seattle Dragons and on the XFL site just about a week ago. So guys like that that have had these longstanding relationships that was facilitated by, you know, by CGS. Um, you know, Anthony Chaffee, a guy I played with his uncle at Monmouth. But a guy that went to CGS that was overlooked because of where he played, right, which kind of goes to the CGS mantra, um, you know, just had a pretty dominant year in the CFL and his second year in the CFL. And I, I'm, I'd be shocked if he didn't get a couple more NFL looks after kind of coming through uh, the Raiders uh, system. So guys like that that are given the opportunity there that ball out and that then take advantage and go on are guys that I want to work with that I want my kids to look up to. You know, those are those are the types that really have to earn it and work for it. I mean, this past year, uh, we're still working transition is and me personally, very hands on with three guys from from last year's class. So uh, and all very different, um, very different positions. I mean, guys like Justin Sumter, who I thought was the standout there in wide receiver. I had a relationship with his coach at Kennesaw State. Um, things didn't go his way because of physical problems. And he lands he lands in Hamilton up at the CFL. But, you know, seeing him push through and seeing the type of person he is. Uh, Brady Oliveira just won the Grey Cup, but he literally sat out the entire year because of an injury. Yeah. Right. That underdog mentality. But like Brady and I talk every day and, and he's just a good person that's giving back. Um, and then uh, Jody Fortson. Jody Fortson was out a couple of weeks ago in Kansas City with him. He's with the Chiefs. He's with the practice squad. This guy, you could Google him. And I did Google him. He was really asking to work with us, like coming from CGS and hearing us speak. And I just, 
I didn't know what this guy's deal was because there was nothing available on him. He went to multiple junior colleges, didn't start playing until late, um, ended up playing at Valdosta, D2, right, wins the national championship, but he's also hurt and abbreviated year and academic ineligibility. I'm like, I can't get any stats on this guy. What makes him think he's going to be in the NFL? Next thing I know, he's been on the Chiefs roster all year. So as – my passion and my involvement is because of these stories and these people that I've built personal relationship with. And, and, and some of that's professional, but I really feel like they're, they're kind of like family guys that are there. And, and as my role has evolved again, at first it was all social media, but I really want guys to think big picture when I'm talking to them is that what can they do beyond next year? Because every one of them, I'll ask them like, all right, what, what are you going to do if this football thing doesn't work out? And every one of them will say to me, well, I'm going to the league. I'm going to be in the NFL. It's going to work out. And I, I know you need that mentality to be successful at that level. But, you know, I can go back to some of these stories. Like even these, which say five that I just mentioned that are success stories, um, you know, they're not there yet. But but they, they're getting there. But they also – see the big picture around them and, and have some contingency plans that are going to ride this as long as they can and as hard as they can and try to make those dreams come true. But in the same time, they're building themselves off the field. They're building their character and, and building a better community around them. And I think that's where I've evolved with my talks at CGS is that, you know, football is great. Football is good. And I'm going to do everything I can to help you succeed on the field, but I'm not going to discard you and replace you next year. Um, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, it is, if you're willing to work and you're willing to be a good person and, and put something in, like every one of you has value. You just don't know how to tap into it. And a lot of people aren't willing to tap into it because they're not seeing a direct financial return right now. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the names that you did because I can I can throw in a few myself. And what the beauty of the podcast being there is that it's not an interview. I mean, you can say, yeah, you're going to go do the, the podcast interview. We're just having a conversation. And it was interesting because there was a few scouts last year that heard about why I was there and what I was doing. And they wanted me to actually interview some of the guys because they thought that maybe they'd be a little bit more loosened up, that maybe they would hear something that didn't sound like scripted or like pre-rehearsed like they would in their one-on-one. And I was more than happy to do it. Whatever gives these guys a better chance, I'm more than happy to do. And so, yeah, Brady was very charismatic. I saw a lot of potential for him. Love that he got to go play back home in Canada. And it it broke my heart when he got hurt. And then I talked to Jody. I could tell he was a, a kid with a big heart and it shows with everything that he's doing with the Chiefs, even on the practice squad. A couple of other guys though, Alexander Hollins, he's with the Vikings right now. I knew that he was going to be a kid to to watch. And then um, I wish Cole Herdman, uh, something would, more would have happened mm-hmm. with him because I thought he would have been a great guy for a team, a franchise to have as far as like, you know, public appearances and things like that. But, you know, even still, there was a lot of guys that I felt I had the chance to talk to that I was like, man, if these guys just get the chance, like there's, there's no limit to what they can do. And Justin um, Sumter actually sent me, a pair of gloves that he signed. And I thought that was big of him because, you know, he didn't have to. And it's like, who am I just a a dude doing a podcast down there? But I think he respects, you know, every opportunity that he gets to try to achieve a dream. And, and that's really what all those guys are down there doing. And so any help they can get any wisdom of someone like you can bestow upon them, I think is huge. And that's why I love CGS so much. And what I tell them, too, is that if I'm helping them and if I'm putting a microscope on them, right, they yeah. need to be good, right? If I'm putting a microscope on something that's bad, it's going to amplify the bad, right, whether that's on the field or off the field. So it really kind of does come back to them is they still need to take care of their business on the field or none of this stuff matters, right? It yep. does. But look, if you want to achieve that dream, you need to take care of your business. So, you right, you take care of your business, we'll take care of the other stuff. and. Um, I think that's what's special about all these guys and a lot of them. I mean, those are just the ones that, you know, I've had these more longer term relationships with. But, you know, I'm pulling for every one of these guys um, because they they are really high character. And like I said, they are also very talented uh, regardless of where they play. Now, some of them, yes, are delusional. But, you know what, so are some of the other guys that are combined. I mean, how many guys are combined? Um, you know, never, never get drafted. I would say over the last couple of years, I've worked with people outside of CGS 
And I, I think the success rate is pretty, pretty balanced. Guys that have been to the quote unquote bigger all-star games are jobless right now. But these guys that come from CGS that, you know, didn't get that combine invite, didn't get that bigger, all, quote unquote, bigger all-star game invite are guys that have jobs because they're willing to work for it and not take it for granted. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you, your personal opinion, since you've obviously done kind of every aspect of, of the business, but, you know, they everybody will tell you, coaches, players, GMs, doesn't matter. They're just like, yeah, I don't, I don't really listen to the criticism a lot. But, yeah, their TVs are all dialed into either NFL Network or ESPN and their radio on car ride to and from work dialed into whatever sports talk show. So it's like they hear the noise. What they do with that noise is on them. But sometimes I feel like you see the guys that show up to CGS and, and it's like they just give off this this vibe that they're more hungry than everybody else because they were told that they wouldn't make it far because they didn't go to a big school or they weren't, you know, 6'2 and 220 pounds or what, whatever it was that you needed to be for your skill position or to succeed in what you wanted to do. So, like... Where is your view on stuff like that? Like, do they listen? And and if stuff like that isn't said, do you think it doesn't motivate somebody to kick it up to the next notch? Uh, absolutely. And I'll give you a, a tangible example without naming names. But there was a, a guy that was entering the draft last year. Uh, he went to my high school uh, several years younger. Um, my coach asked me, uh, our coach, we had a mutual coach um, who had been at the school forever, said, hey, can you help him out? You know, just keep an eye on him. And so I was helping him in, in sort of the, the, the recruitment process in the sense of agents trying to recruit him. And, you know, one thing I was very adamant about is don't just default to the guys that just want to sing your praises and tell you how great they are or you are, they are, and all the wonderful things that they can do for them, uh, do for you, right? I told him, look, put things in buckets, right? All of them are going to tell you this stuff right we're going to pay for your training we're going to do this we're going to do that i said what you really need is people that are going to be honest with you and help you get better right ask them straight up what what do i need to do to take myself from an undrafted free agent to a seventh round draft pick from a seventh round draft pick to a fifth round draft pick? what do, what are my faults like i i specifically said forget the guys telling you how wonderful you are right you know you're wonderful this is why they're recruiting you right ask the guys Look for the guy that's going to be upfront with you and, and tell you what your, you know, what your, um, you know, what your perceived negatives are. Uh, and and I, I, I stand by that. And I think you have a point, right? So guys that are coming out of these these Power Five conferences that you know have all these accolades is they've never heard how bad they are. Uh, you know, uh, I mentioned our podcast and the conference that kind of went along with it. Um, Bullock had mentioned in this there's. Pac-Man Jones and Keith Bullock were, were doing this talk about basically how Pac-Man just screwed up. And it was right when AB was getting cut from the Raiders, right around that time. And something Keith brought up on the panel when somebody asked him, like, what is your thought on this as this news is breaking? He says, well, AB is the greatest player at what he does. Right? He's the greatest wide receiver in the world. Nobody's going to tell him otherwise or nobody's going to tell him what's wrong he's surrounded by yes men and, and keith's exact thing was he didn't have checks and balances so a lot of these guys that come from these power fives they're told how great they are and they don't have these checks and balances and i do i think they take it for granted you hear about bus right bus right that's probably a big part of it where are your checks and balances where are the people that are going to be in your corner looking out for your best interest by being honest with you and i do think that these guys that come in here learning how bad they are or not how bad they are or you know where their faults are, how they're not going to make it, that they are underdogs, have a bit of a chip on their shoulder and are willing to work to get there. So you need to be on people that are honest with you and you need to be honest with yourself. What is a real assessment? Um, you know, what I try to do on, on the flip side is, you know, from a marketing perspective is how do I, how do I emphasize their strengths, right? I call it like money ball, right? So how do I find that value where people aren't looking for value? And how do I extract that and how do I push that out? Similarly, how do we, you know, how do we counter your negatives, me publicly, while you on the background are trying to work to, you know, you know to fix those, to fix those negatives. So it's a team, it's a process, but it, it's all about transparency, honesty, and communication. 
and and the whole team being on board and by team i mean you know the agent the family the player you know the the pr marketing people right like let's work towards a common goal which is getting better and achieving something greater uh, and we're not going to do that if we just sit back on our laurels and assume it's going to come to us because you know we were you know we were the top star in a D3 school. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's going to be handed to us. Like, no, I'm a top star at a D3 school because I work my ass off to get there and I'm not done working yet. Right. I need to do X, Y, and Z if I want to be a top star in even the XFL or, you know, the indoor league or the NFL. Right. Um, keep that mentality. Keep that, that underdog. And you know, it was like the Eagles. I'm an Eagles fan. Right. <laughs> hungry, <laughs> hungry dogs eat or run fastest or whatever they said. Yeah. Be that hungry dog. man. What was the moment that sold you on CGS? Um, I think it was probably one of the first or second years that I was there. And there, there were three individuals. So we can always like fact check this and figure out what it was. But it was uh, Justin Malone from Mississippi State. Shaquille, um, oh, what's his name, from UNC. Uh, Shaquille Rashad, I think. Um and uh, there was a, uh, a kicker as well. And the three of them came up to me after I spoke and pulled me aside and waited for everybody else. And I think them proactively coming up, asking intelligent questions and um, really absorbing what I was saying, I think was showing that I was making an impact and a difference. And I, I think that's what it was. It was when I got that feedback that people were grasping what I was saying, it showed me that I'm offering them something of value or something that they hadn't heard in the past. Um, so I, I remember specifically Justin and Shaq because I still talk to those two. Oh, Worth Gregory was the, uh, was the kicker, I believe. Um, and, and Justin, you know, moved to, uh, moved to Brooklyn at one point. I was working up there and, and got together with him a couple of times. Um, you know, post career. And, and he has a story, I won't get into it, but, you know, some of the things that he had heard as a player and getting injured um, just kind of solidified that for me. But yeah, I would say the thing, I was already pretty sold to begin with, but when guys came up, asked the right questions, you know, asked questions pertaining to what I was talking about, showed me that, um, you know, I could, I could help somebody. And I, and I think that's what I really appreciate the most is that my role in it is being able to help a couple guys, um, you know, make sure that they have a fruitful life, not just a fruitful career. Yeah, absolutely. And I am so stoked for this year. Um, I obviously have a, a much bigger role because I get to uh, put together and host a, a media day with Emery Hunt, uh, which is going to be uh, fantastic. I think it's something that was was missing last year, but it, I don't think you would have missed it as much as you would this year because, you know, Jose is always out to sort of outdo himself and exceed his own bar and level of expectations. And I believe with all the phone calls and the emails that we've seen um, that he's really on the right track to, to make this one exactly what he wants it to be, which is bigger than, than the last one. And that's kind of the goal and mentality every year. So I'm excited to see you back there and a bunch of other folks that I met last year. Cause I think that this really is, you know, as advertised, which is um, an alternative that still does what it needs to do as far as getting the young athletes, uh, a second look, a first look, or, or just uh, another platform. So, uh, Don, very excited to see you, and I definitely want to thank you for your time today. Thanks, and, and if I could just add to what you said, I think the testament to that is not us who are involved with this program saying how great it is. I think the testament is, one, if you go there, it does get better every year, and I can say that because I have been all but one year the first year. Yeah. Um, but number two, the fact that you know every team is represented. And the agents that are there and the personnel that is there and the scouts that are there, uh, if they if this was no good, they wouldn't be there. <laughs> so I think that <laughs> it's not we don't have to tell you how great it is. Just look who is there, you know, taking in this talent. So I, I'm, I'm stoked to be there. I'm stoked to see what happens with the media day. I know in the past we've had some regional TV. We've you know, we've had some uh, some web guys. But like you said, growing a little bit. Uh, each year has been uh, has been pretty stellar, and you know I, I think it's in great hands between you and Emery, who are not just super talented, but very in tune with this community and this group, and have have just done great things on your own uh, to promote you know guys like this and the sport itself, and 
and seeing you take a more active role is pretty awesome. So thank you. I'm looking forward to it as well. All right. Well, he is Don Povia, and he does digital. He does marketing. He does sports. He does consulting. He does all of it, and he will be at CGS uh, January 4th through the 8th. And, uh, hey, man, looking forward to seeing you down there. You take care of yourself and enjoy the weekend. And, uh, of course, very Merry Christmas to you. Uh, Thank you, sir. And I'll see you just after the New Year. All right. Happy New Year as well.